Yes, it's great to network and say, this is my name, this is my CV, this is what I do. And then you might get one job out of it. But if you build a connection with someone, it's, it turns into something else. And from that photo shoot, it could turn into even bigger projects. Welcome to the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I'm Angela Nicholson, and I'm the founder of She Clicks, which is a community for female photographers. In these podcasts, I talk with women in the photographic industry to hear about their experiences, what drives them, and how they got to where they are now. Our guest today is Violetta Sophia, a portrait photographer and artist whose work is featured in publications like Vogue, Elle, Deadline Hollywood, and The Telegraph. Beyond her commercial success, Violetta explores themes of identity and race. Violetta is also one of the four winners of the 701540 project, which aims to address the underrepresentation of women in visual storytelling. Hi, Violetta. Thank you so much for joining me today on the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me, Angela. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, can we start right at the beginning by hearing about what first got you hooked on photography? Uh, so I think um, one of the reasons why I chose photography is because um, I thought it was a faster medium for me to express what I wanted to say. So I'm one of these kind of persons that is always having ideas and I've done painting, I started painting, but um, in college I realised that photography just allows me to put more out there. But before that, my dad was the person that got me into photography. I haven't said him because I thought I was just doing it because it was with him, but he was the one that... Um, me my cameras and we used to go out and take pictures but I don't think I mean in my head it feels like it wasn't a conscious decision I was just copying my dad right so that really came at college yeah but he was the one that initiated me into um, taking pictures often seems to be the dads that trigger women into photography there's been a few cases where it's been mums or even grandmothers but more often than not dads and we probably know lots of reasons for that but why why portrait photography for you um why portrait photography i just like the connection with the people i mean when i was growing up it was landscapes it was easy it's accessible you can always take pictures then when i was going when i was in college uh it was still landscapes then i started doing projects with people and I just feel I like people in general. I like talking to people. And I just feel like having a camera and being able to observe people deeper is something that came quite natural to me. And I also like, um, I mean, I kind of like that kind of power that you get when you can hide behind the camera and observe, really observe people. I mean, in some in some countries, uh, you're not even allowed to look at people. You're not even to observe and study people. But once you hold the camera, you're allowed to do it. So it feels a good way. It, it's a good excuse for me to talk to people and get really close to people and just analyze how a person moves, how a person talks, how a person pauses and capture that moment. Yeah. And what did you actually study at college? Okay, so what did I do? So when um, when I came, so I came to London when I was 16 from Spain. So when I was doing my GCCs, I was doing photography, I was doing uh, art, so painting a lot, and textiles. And uh, when I went to university, I studied media. And then I went back into the photography. I was really scared of doing photography at first. It took me a very long time. For me to decide that yes this is what i want even though it was always what i loved was i was just too scared to do it yeah what, what were you scared about <laughs> so uh i grew up in spain i came here when i was 16 so doing any art subject was just a no-go like you were i mean i've been bullied criticized by students teachers because i was just good at art i was good at arts and i was good at sports right and I was always put down by the fact that you do art, so you're not going to amount to anything. And I came into this country brainwashed into, if I do art, 
it's, 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 it's not going to take me anywhere. But when I moved into this country, all my teachers were like, oh, no, you should do art. You should do art. And I was like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I've told all my life not to do it. And you're really welcoming the fact that I'm enjoying it, that I'm good at it. And I mean, I could, so compared, so I came and I felt so much freedom coming into the education in this country because I could pick whatever subjects I want. I could do as much art as I wanted, which was criticized before. So my sketchbooks were super thick. My work, I mean, I wouldn't stop. I'm watching TV, I'm painting, I'm drawing, I'm taking pictures. So um, eventually choosing photography was a hard one because even though I had all that support when I came into this country, it did take me some time until I identify where I really wanted to do and just jump, go for it. And I've never looked back since. And when you say you chose photography, were that that was as your career, you were gonna you were gonna make a go of it as a professional photographer? Yes, yeah, so, I mean I chose so I think I don't know, it must have been in two thousand and seventeen. Where I mean, even previous to that, I've always taken pictures, but I think it was in 2017 when I tried everything and nothing was really satisfying me. I was like, okay, I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be a photographer and I'm just going to jump. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to put everything I have and slowly leave all my other part-time work. And that's what I did. So in 2017, I think I got accepted into for an exhibition into the Royal Academy of Arts. And that was the exhibition that set me off to, you're going to be an artist. And I chose to carry on with the portraiture. I mean, immediately from that time, I, my the doors started open. So an agency, uh, magazines, art in amazing places. So it was that conscious decision of, or me, I mean, maybe it wasn't a decision. Maybe nothing else was working. And I was like, okay, when I'm putting all this effort and things that I don't really like, and I'm getting the same results as I would as if I go and pursue what I like. So that's how I think I decided to to do what I do. Yeah. How do you find your first commercial clients? So I've, like I said, I mean, I've always I've always done photography, kind of like on the side. So I always had like little clients. So I think my first celebrity portrait was maybe about 20 years ago. So I had little opportunities that came and I was doing while I was doing other work. But in 2017 and 2018, when I decided that I, I mean, I guess I started networking more and I found myself in um, uh, one of my biggest clients that I think that has changed, that has um, changed my career, I should say, is um, I went to Cannes. So I always wanted to do celebrity portrait jump. I went into Cannes. I went into a party. I did not know what I was doing in Cannes. My friends took me there. I was like, what am I doing here? I'm a photographer. I'm not in the film industry. And I found myself in a party, took it, talking to the creative director of Deadline magazine. And a couple hours later, he was offering me a job. I thought he was lying. I was a little bit tipsy. <laughs> And then I went back to London and he called me and he was like, yeah, I've got this job for you. Do you think you could do it? I was like, yes. I mean, I'm always the type of says, yes, yes, yes. Even though I don't know how I feel at the time, but I will always say yes. And that's how the collaboration started. And ever since, I mean, it's been, what, five, six years. And that job has opened a lot of doors for me. Amazing. So when you were at that party in your head, yeah, were you just at a party or were you networking? How did you see it? I guess I was networking. I'm, I love always talking to people and I'm always going around. I mean, I'm, I never have, when I go to parties and I, I don't really have that, oh, I need to network and I'm direct and no, I'm, I'm there to have fun. And I also like to collaborate with people that I get along. So I'm not going to go for someone that I don't like just for them to give me a job. Yeah. So this person was just standing in the corner. He wasn't even in calling any attention but I was just so happy to be in that party because I couldn't connect with any of the other parties or any of the other events when I went to Cannes because everything was film related everything was about actors and producers and projects and it's also a different it, it was just it wasn't my comfort zone yeah and then I ended up in this magazine and I was like oh I understand about magazines I understand about photography I understand about creative directors 
makeup artist. So it felt more like my home. And I was, and the drinks were free and <laughs> were celebrities and I had my lipstick and a fabulous dress. And I was just happy to be there. And I was talking to the creative director and someone else was commenting about me getting a job in Deadline magazine. And then he said to me something like, oh, no, if you need a job, you need, it needs to come through me. So I'm the creative director. So from that point, we started laughing. And that's how we build a relationship until now. So it's, I think I keep it up because of the relationships that I build with people. Oh, I lovely. Yeah. I think it is interesting. I don't know if you've been to a party where you feel like you have been networked, if you know what I mean. Somebody comes up to you and they, it's almost like, I've got five minutes to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm going over there to talk to that person. And, oh, someone just m- much more important than you has just walked through the door. So I'm off. <laughs> and you kind of think, yeah. Okay. And I think they missed the point that it's about forming a connection yeah. with someone. So, you know, some people, it just won't work. But Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do try to... I mean, I'm I'm not always great at networking. I have been to events where I'm like, oh my God, this really feels like networking and I'm not having fun. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's it's, it's very awkward to me. And yeah, so I, I need to talk to people and then first assess how are we communicating. I might be talking to you about things that are completely random, things that are very personal and then I see how you react and then from there, we build something because yes, it's great to network and say, this is my name, this is my CV, this is what I do. And then you might get one job out of it. But if you build a connection with someone, it's, it turns into something else. And from that photo shoot, it could turn into even bigger project. Yeah. When I approach a company or when I try to do something, I don't just come do the job and leave. I always like to leave a mark and change something. Yeah. And for your photography to be recognized, I guess, for your specific work. Yeah, I mean, even if it's just for the um, for the company itself. I mean, I, for example, the example I could give with this is the National Portrait Gallery. So they approached me. They wanted two of my portraits. Or they wanted, actually, they wanted just one portrait. And then it turned out being two portraits. But then from those two portraits, I thought, we could do this better. Why don't we try this? And then that turned into another exhibition. And now I'm working on other projects with that. So if I see something that could be done better, I want to bring the whole of myself, the whole of my experience, and also thinking about people that might look like me that also need those opportunities. So if I could create a door or a change, a positive change, I would always try to do that. (laughs) So it's very hard for me to come to a place and be like, okay, Give me the job, I do it, and then I go home, and then wait for the next job and go home. I have to, if I see something, let's make it better. So, if somebody rings you to offer you a project, or you know, to, to, to wanting to work with you, what are the projects that really make you excited and want to go and work with them? Ah, uh, the projects that really make me excited. Wow. Okay, that's a question. In general, anything that is creative, anything that is original. And anything that is going to make people think differently (laughs) is the kind of projects that I love. Anything that is conceptual as well. So I really like those kind of projects. But I think I'm really attracted by social projects. So things that, um, I mean, there are some projects that when they approach me with them, they make me cry. And I really want to, um, so I did a project with Sister Space, for example, where it's about uh, violence, domestic violence. And the whole process was quite emotional. And also you hope in that, because it was about changing the law around domestic violence for women of color. Right. And so projects like that, they really touch my heart because I feel like I'm mixing uh, the creativity, I'm mixing the portraiture that I love, but at the same time, I'm trying to send the message and influence people into looking in a different way at something that we see all the time, but it's not changing. Yeah. So it's important to you that you really feel that cause or that, that message they're trying to convey so that you can really kind of get all the feeling in into your image. Yeah, no, I do. I I do. I mean, I can't do it all the time. And probably I don't want to do it all the time because it could be quite heavy as well. Yeah. But uh, to me, it's important that I could also use my photography to... And it doesn't have to be complicated. It's just a simple message, simple picture. It's nice to be attached to a project that could change 
something and that could help a group of people, a small group, a big group. Yeah. So that's what I would like. What about personal projects? Are they important to you as well? Yeah, so those, I mean, those are the personal projects. And normally I do attach, my personal project is always about race. It's always about uh, women. It's always about representation. So these kind of projects that I'm talking about that really connect with me, most of the time end up being about race or uh, representation of uh, black females and women of color. And I, I try to do them... If I could do them once a year, if I could do one project a year, that would be that would be ideal. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but I mean, more and more I'm trying to include what I do also into my commercial. When you say do one project a year, how long do you sort of envisage that lasting? You know, is that is that a 12 month project or is that, you know, <laughs> two weekends? <laughs> that all year? It used to be I'll do it two weeks, one month. But now, for example, this year I'm working on a project that is literally taking me the whole year. Um, I'm doing it in a way that I could also, um, so I mean, my commercial stuff takes priority. But um, but this is also because I also feel that the way I get noticed is by doing my personal projects, by writing things for myself if that makes sense. <laughs> and um, I've also changed the way I work, where before maybe if I'm doing a personal project, it would come out of my pocket. Yeah. But now I'm working with other brands and funding because I got to a point I'm trying to change something. I'm not doing this project for me. I'm doing it for the world. So I, say I, so I said to myself, I shouldn't be the one paying for this. So have you gone out and pitched to people to get funding so you can work on this project? Yeah, so uh, I've pitched uh, brands and normally also the art funds as well. And then if there is a collaboration, there could also be a collaboration of where I know that I'm going to exhibit. I mean, this is a project that I'm still working on it, so I can't really disclose uh, where is the final project going into. Right. But then if I have like an institution that is interested, but maybe they can't, really afford the project so we find a third party that will be able to fund all of that which is now a brand because I, the project I think is unfair for me just to to pay for something that is not really for me instead it's going to impact a bigger group of people yeah yeah so in a way you're looking for a commercial uh, well, no, you're looking for an income stream for a personal project because of its bigger story. Yeah. Is that how you balance your commercial and personal projects by doing that? Yeah, yeah. If not, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be, if I don't find the, the funding, I wouldn't be able to do it. And if I do it, it would be, it wouldn't have the same impact. I will have to do it for like two weeks, one month. But then otherwise, I, I, I just get tired I need help as well. I need to pay people that are helping me. Yeah. So that is, um, yeah. I mean, another way of doing as well, these kind of things is entering a competition. Like the MPV or many competitions that are actually looking for projects that they can fund. Yeah. I was going to come on to that. But when you've got a project that's like burning into you because, you know, you're so excited about it, it's really important and you're writing to people requesting funding and doing this and that. And then you get a phone call, whatever A-lister is in town and we need you to pop out and take a photograph. Do you find it hard to sort of switch off and sort of say, just go and do that thing, which, because that is, you know, go connect with the person, get the money, go back to what you do. Do you find it really hard to switch? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I don't find it hard to switch. And I think it's nice to switch sometimes. If not, it just... It becomes too much. So I think having the the commercial, having different ways of of bringing income, I think is um, I think is good and healthy. <laughs> okay. If I was just doing commercial, 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 I wouldn't be happy. If I was just doing personal projects, mentally they could be quite heavy as well. Yeah, could be exhausting. So um, yeah, and yeah, and I think having commercial as well, commercial work is also an easy way to detach and just come and do the work and leave without having to 
plan for everything without having to be emotionally attached to the project and just have fun, do the work create the best work possible and just hand it out. So that also feels very good. Yeah. Please excuse this interruption. This podcast is sponsored by MPB, the world's largest platform for used photography and videography kit. MPB has transformed the way people buy, sell and trade equipment, making photography more accessible, affordable and sustainable. MPB is proud to partner with SheClicks to help support women photographers and their work. Okay, let's get back to the show. So what inspired you to apply for the 701540 project? Um, so it was, I think to me, it coincided with the project that I was doing at the time and the title was Change. <laughs> and at the time I was coming from, from an exhibition with the National Portrait Gallery where they were doing, they were creating something to us change, where they were doing an exhibition about female photographers and female sitters. So if I take it back a little bit, so when I went into the National Portrait Gallery, it was the reopening of the National Portrait Gallery. It was an exhibition about female sitters, female photographers. I was the only photographer. I asked them, do you have any other black female photographers? And they were like, no, you're the only one. And I was like, okay, well, I would like to contribute, assist into how we could turn this around. And I proposed to them, I mean, they were quite open. I normally do actors and Flavia, who was the curator at the time, was like, well, we will also be interested in seeing normal women or women that are achieving in other areas apart from being a celebrity. And I thought, okay, interesting. So I started researching. I always wanted to include in my portfolio women that are not actresses as well. And... um I just created this list, so I gave them about 25 names and six of them are now sitting in another exhibition and it's the project that I want to extend, it's the project that I want to do more of. And then this MPB came in and I was like, oh, okay, so this is going to give me the freedom to carry on with this kind of um, exhibition and just take pictures of whoever I want to photograph because I know the National Portrait Gallery has been great but they also have limitations to who do they have to exhibit and then you have to ask and ask and ask and then there is a a huge layer of um, limitations or where you can achieve whatever you want to achieve so when the NPV came in I was like oh great I could do whatever I want I could photograph whoever I want so the word change and female in photography and it's also female competition. I thought this goes really well together. So that was the initial project. Okay. So I probably should point out to people who don't know about it, MPB conceived the idea of the 701540 project to support female photographers and videographers. Uh, You're one of the four winners. What can you tell us about your project that you're working on as part of that initiative? We'll be right back after this short break. Please excuse this interruption. This podcast is supported by Canon, a leading technology company founded in Japan in 1937. Canon is dedicated to helping people reimagine and push the boundaries of what is possible through imaging. Canon believes in living and working together for the common good to develop a better society and a more inclusive and equitable world. Let's get back to the episode. Yes. So my project has changed. Huh? <laughs> so the project has changed. I'm still doing the, the females and I'm still doing it by separately, but my project has changed to my hand masters. Right. So I do take pictures of my hands. So normally I do hand masters which are inspired by all masters. So originally I started taking pictures of my hands because I wanted to see the development and connect with the change of my body and how it's affecting me but now I want to take it a little bit further and look into my background and my ancestry and African practices coming from my mum and my dad's side. Okay so your project is continually evolving then it is changing all the time by the sounds of things. Yes literally yeah I mean yes I mean it's really hard (laughs) it's a little bit hard to talk about it because I'm still working on it and find it a little bit intimidating because I'm talking about, yes, I'm going to talk about my ancestors and I'm going to talk about practices and I'm going to be looking into mystic 
aspects of where I come from. And talking about these things and doing them might be completely different. So I'm still not sure what I'm doing, but uh, I think that also creates the magic of surprise. And <laughs> I mean, surprise for everyone, surprise for myself, surprise for uh, <laughs> for the people that are going to look at it because I do want to change it a little bit. I think right now I'm concentrating on the beauty, but I want, it, I want them to be a little bit more raw and a little bit more authentic in a way that is my story. Okay. So I was going to ask you what we can expect to see from you at the exhibition, which is in November. But it sounds like you don't know yet exactly. <laughs> but at what point are you going to draw a line and say, right, I'm going to shoot it? <laughs> so what you can expect is it's going to be my all my hand masters. So I photograph. So normally when I do the hand masters, I photograph flowers holding my, uh, hold by my hands. And then I'm wearing the beautiful clothing. So I want to pay more attention to the objects that are around me, the fruits that are around me, the flowers that I'm holding. So I'm looking into African flowers. Right. I'm looking into how I will arrange it differently, the ornaments that I will be wearing, and also including the practices that um, have been done to me as, as a child or the practice that I've seen my parents doing. And uh, that's what I'm trying to put together. At the moment, I'm experimenting and it's a lot of fun because normally I'm quite um, organized and I know exactly what I'm going to do. But lately I've been throwing things on the table and being a little bit more messy and I've been also surprising my. Okay. So that is, it's interesting not to know, as much as it's scary, but it's also interesting not to know what I'm doing and see another side. I mean, I'm also taking this exhibition as an experimentation of a project that I wanted to be, that would be much bigger. So I'm really excited. Your mind is constantly leapfrogging, isn't it? From one project to the next one, evolve this, do that. Yeah. Then you've got some big thing. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. What advice would you give to other female photographers or other black female photographers who are contemplating applying for a bursary or perhaps a, a scheme like the 701540 project? Oh, my advice is just to go for it. To apply, it doesn't matter if you have time, because sometimes you look at opportunities and if they come... Re- I mean, I think if you, if you catch them really early, you're like, oh, you have all this space to be like, oh, yeah, I really want to apply, but then you, you become, oh, but are men going to apply? Or am I, are my pictures good enough? So you have too much time to start doubting yourself and then you're like, oh, okay, I'll do it next year. Yeah. And and also when you come really late, it's like, oh, I don't have time and blah, blah. So I just feel like send whatever, send it whenever. And just it might, it might surprise you. I mean, my MPB application, I did it really, it was, I just found out about it and I was like, oh, let me, let me apply because it just sounded so interesting. But it's just a blind, not be fearful. And I know that there are not enough women applying for competitions unless it's specifically for women and especially women of colour and then especially black women. They're not applying to competitions. So I've just been asked to be judge of one another competition and they wanted me to come in especially because they needed more black female artists to submit so I've been trying to invite as many people as possible yeah you need the visibility don't you yeah they need they need I think they need to be more included I think also competitions what they should do is I mean it's really I've seen it myself so I have applied to think if I don't see a black judge I felt like "Mm, she's not going to understand my story she's not going to understand what I'm trying to say so I think it goes both ways. Yes, women in general should be feel more confident. Then black women in general should feel more confident. But then it's also from the other side, what do we see? If I only see men, if I only see all the men, it's harder for me to, oh, let me submit my picture that talks about hair and, I don't know, uh, pregnancy or something else. Yeah. So I think it's very, very important to what we see as people that are submitting into these projects yeah 
I think more competitions and projects are recognising that they need to make their juries more inclusive because that is that is what attracts a lot of people yeah. to apply if they feel they can connect. So, yeah, great stuff. I mean, it's, it's quite complicated, but you need to have a variety of judges. Of So if I'm submitting a portrait, I want to see maybe someone that is interested in portraits. If all the artists do landscape. They're not gonna add my. They're not gonna like my work, and um, yeah. So, I mean, it's something that we're learning. It's something I don't know if it's hard or difficult, but um, if we communicate, if we talk, we find a way of doing and achieving all these things. If not, people are not going to apply. Yeah. So get involved. Yes. I think that's a really good point to go to six from she clicks. I've got ten questions from she clickers, and I would like you to answer six questions, please. Okay. By picking numbers from 1 to 10. So if I could have your first number, please. Number 10. Number 10. Now, this is a great question, actually. What do you feel is the most successful way to challenge stereotypes? That question is from Liz. Oh, my God. What is the most successful way to challenge stereotypes? I think, to me, it's just to not avoid them. And just go for the stereotype and put it in people's faces. I think that makes people think about the obvious, if that makes sense. I think to me personally, if I try to avoid the stereotype and try and do something else, I think I will put it into people's faces. It's like, do you really think this is how I am or how basic it is? I don't know if that makes sense, but I would just go front go with it. Yeah. 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 Is that something you consciously do in your projects? I think it's something that I consciously do in everything that I do. Like even when I'm talking and people say some stereotypical, they have some stereotypical idea about something. I'll be like, oh, really? Is that how you, because I'm a woman, I should behave that way? Or because I'm a color, I should. Yeah. So I'm just quite, I think in general, I'm quite direct with uh, these sorts of things. Okay. Can I have your second number then, please? Uh, number one. Okay. What or who do you feel are the main barriers to women, trans or non-binary photographers from getting those properly paid photographic jobs? That question is from Shelley. Things are changing, but we're very used to seeing photographers as male and older male, which I think is also something that is changing. But I always try to look at what I could change. So I can't really change the perception of other people so I try myself to because I've also seen a lot of people that or a lot of women that blame it on the outside but then you ask them I mean this is quite basic I'm I'm sure the person that has asked this question has a portfolio on a website but I've seen a lot of people that complain but then you ask them do you have a portfolio they say no are you applying to these opportunities and they say no are you no 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 so I think if you're good with your portfolio and what you're doing and you're working on yourself, then the next thing is work on your confidence and then still approach these things because I have no control into going into an interview and they're going to judge me by the way I look. If they want to do that, I can't do anything about that, but I could do about the work that I present, how I present myself. And then try not to use, even though it's a reality, but I try not to use those as excuses as well. Yeah, got you. I mean, yes, those are barriers. Yeah. But you can only control what you can control. So your barriers that you can deal with are your confidence and actually putting yourself out there and putting the effort in. Yeah, well, you need to put yourself, because I've seen a lot of, a lot, a lot of women complaining and the majority, I mean, I've seen men as well, but the majority were women and they're like, no racism or no, because I'm a woman and not. But then you thought, where's your work? Have you submitted? Why don't you enter your work? And they're like, no, no, no. And I'm like, well, we can't really, you can't really complain then. And this is things that we do. I do them as well. So this is things that we do all the time. And I try to always fix me. And then if the, everything else wants to go with me, it's fine. If not, I can't, I can't do anything. Okay. Could I have your third number, please? Number three. What is your process for a hand master's shoot? <laughs> so my process is, depends on how much money I have. So I have a table 
everything that I take on the hand masters is me. There is no AI. There might be some photo shoot, some Photoshop in terms of because I'm hiding behind my arms. So my head might pop out on the side. So I might get rid of that, but everything else is on the picture. So I have my camera tethered to my laptop, tethered to an iPad, tethered to an iPhone. So the iPhone sometimes will be here. So this is when I'm just doing it on my own. Right. iPhone will be here and I will be pressing with whatever I have or I can. Right. Have you got a very long tongue or something? You can... <laughs> <laughs> yes. A town might know anything, so I would just be pressing. And, um, but doing it that way, sometimes it could be a little bit difficult, of course, because I have to be aware of the shirt. I have to be aware of my hand. And then I have to use my hands to press, even though if it's on a timer, and I find a beautiful pose. I have to go back. By the time my hand is back, it's a completely different pose. Mm. But with multiple shots, you can achieve it. The other option is if my husband is in the room watching TV, I give him the iPad and he just press, 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 and I'm just there. <laughs> yeah. And so I need to have the TV on. If not, he would just give up really quickly. And then the other option is if I have a team and like, I think the biggest number of people that I've done it with is like four people. So I just, um, for example, I just finished a collaboration with a flower shop. So they were doing all the flowers, which was great. And then someone was pressing, someone was looking at the shirt, some, so I didn't have to do anything, just look at the screen and be like, yeah, it's fine, let's do it. So it depends. But all of, all of them are quite fun and interesting, even when I do it with my tongue. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> have you tried a remote release that you can press with your toe or something? Yes, that's true. That's true. Yes, yes, that's true. Probably not as much fun, though. I just feel like it will be an extra thing to worry about yeah, you probably stand on it quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I have your fourth number, please? Number four. Number four. If there was something that you could share with your younger self as you started out in your photographic or art journey, what would it be? That question's from Liz. If I have to start, um, <laughs> probably I would say to myself, pick another career. <laughs> you know, completely. <laughs> <laughs> No, you can't do that. Uh, and then if you can't do that, I'll be like, yep, um, I would have I would have started earlier. Mm -hmm. I would have said, go for it, believe in it. And because I think I started, the time I started believing in myself and kind of giving up, everything i think i was 27 so from that process of no if you do arts or that brain wash or if you do i'm not gonna achieve anything uh if that would have been removed from my life and i would have been able to start to start that kind of mentality earlier yeah that would have been so much better and i'm quite glad because now so i've gone from being the only black female photographer in the room or the only woman in a room when i was starting in photography when now i see a lot of young women yeah. coming into rooms and being educated i mean still it's still not right quite there because it, it's, it's also something that sets me that you go into colleges you see a lot of women studying photography you go into exhibitions, you see a lot of women. You go into talks, you see a lot of young girls. But then when you see the women working, mm -hmm. then those numbers are not equal. Yeah. But at least I'm starting to see more of them. Yeah. Yeah. Progress is being made, but it's not as fast as we would like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Could I have your fifth number, please? Number five. What moment of your career are you most proud of to date? That question's from Anne and Janina. Uh, I'm most proud of, um, I think, um, having my picture at the National Portrait Gallery. I'm very, it was, um, it happened during the lockdown. All my jobs were being cancelled. I was like, oh my God, my career has been cancelled. I don't know what I'm going to do. You're sitting on a sofa, just watching the news, watching the numbers, eating. And then all of a sudden I got an email from, from that because I took pictures of, um, of actresses that, because it was really hard to get people together, photograph them. So I was one of the lucky people to have photographed 
a promising young woman and the film did so well and it was such a feminist film and everyone started contacting me so Vogue contacted me Elle magazine contacted me Hello magazine contacted me I was like oh my god what's happening and then the National Portrait Gallery contacted me I was crying in my house and it's a place as a portrait photographer that was the ultimate dream for me fantastic and they took my picture and they were super welcoming and what I really appreciated about them is even though they were really much aware of how the world is changing and representation and discrimination and racism they were really they were accommodating they wanted to include me in the story without trying to change me because of it's fashionable mm. so they were really open to hear what I wanted to say and then from one picture I pushed to have two pictures. <laughs> I thought, oh, I want two pictures at the National Portrait Gallery. <laughs> and I was like, these people that have more than one picture. And then they said, okay, they like the picture. And then I was like, okay, now I want a project. So I'm, pr I'm proud of them asking for that picture that happened at the time. But I'm also, what I'm most proud of is going in, not demanding, but of wanting more. So I'm proud of me wanting more to do with what makes me happy. Yes. And then from there was, there was another. So right now there's an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery, Rule 31, that was instigated by me saying I'm the only black female photographer. You need more photographers. You need more sitters. And now that wrong is showed representation. So I think that process I had with the National Portrait Gallery, where now they have four pictures it's um, my most proudest moment for using my voice to create change. Yeah, I think you're right to be proud of those those achievements. That's fantastic. So your final number then, please. Uh, did they say number six? Not yet. Okay. Do you want number six? Number six. Oh, should I let you pick? Can you pick for me? Okay, hang on. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, da 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 Okay, let's go for this. Number nine, if you could photograph a portrait of anyone in the world, who would it be? And that's another question from Anne and Janina. Okay, so uh, it would be, I mean, I would love to photograph Naomi Campbell. I just feel that she's, she's changing, she's growing. I mean, I don't know, I just feel like normally you see, you, you see women after 30, 35, just like you're dent. But I feel the fact that she keeps going and she's coming back and she's stronger and she's redefining herself and she's, it feels, I mean, to the media, it feels like she's a completely different person and she's seen in a different way. So in terms of photography, it would be her. And also I was asked this question some time ago as well, when the queen passed away. And that was someone that I would have loved to photograph as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there is something, yeah, iconically. I, I was going to say, two very iconic women. And iconic is a word that's somewhat overused, but they really are. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I see, I think, I mean, I, well, I've been asked this question before and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I was like, oh, I would have loved to photograph the Queen. Especially when her portraits were all around central London. I was like, that would have been a really, a really, a really good picture. Yeah, that would have been fantastic. So now I need to target the royals now as well. And Naomi Campbell. And Naomi Campbell, yeah. No, Naomi Campbell would be amazing to photograph her, yeah. Where would you photograph her? Anywhere. Okay. It doesn't matter. I will photograph her anywhere. Someone that I admire so much, I just feel like, Things that have had the way she's been portrayed, it wasn't great. And then I just feel like she's grown so much and now she's come back as this completely new person, but still the same. And also I really, I would have loved to photograph her with her kid. She became a mum when she was 50. I know she doesn't. So I would like to do something where you don't really see the face of the kids because she doesn't like to show the face of the kids. But I would like to photograph her as a full person which is i'm still a model i'm still strong i stood by what i believe 
And now I've got kids, so I would have loved to include all of that in a poetry. And she's got an amazing face, amazing cheekbones, and yeah, mm. I like her. Yeah. Oh, well, fingers crossed. Maybe it will happen. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> well, Violetta, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really lovely chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to everyone who sent in a question. You'll find links to Violetta's website and social media channels in the show notes. I'll be back with another episode soon, so please subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast platform and tell all your friends and followers about it. You'll also find She Clicks on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube if you search for She Clicks Net. So until next time, enjoy your photography.